Now, if you're going to be working in any type of Microsoft administration services these days, there are some fundamental principles that are very important that you understand. So what I want to do is I want to get into some of the foundations of understanding things like Microsoft domains, understanding some of the networking technologies, RAS and VPNs and virtualization, and also we're going to talk about the cloud services and how all that fits into this. But it's important to kind of start from the beginning so you can understand where things have been, understand where things are going, and you have to consider the fact that you know we're, the world is transitioning now more into a cloud-oriented uh, environment, but in the past everything was managed on-prem or on-premise, and we got to talk about this transition and how things were and how things are now and where Microsoft is going. So to start with, you know, we go back go back in time to the 1950s, 1960s. They had mainframes, these gigantic computers that would take up like entire rooms. Uh, they used vacuum tubes. And then as we moved into the 1970s, something miraculous happened. They created what was known as an IC, an integrated circuit, which allowed uh, basically binary math to be processed through little chips and this is where personal computing became popular so in the 1980s personal computers started coming out I'm gonna draw this little symbol here to represent a computer and uh, I tell you what I'm gonna create another little uh, symbol here to kinda represent a bunch of computers so in the 1980s companies started buying PCs and personal computers and they started showing up in people's offices and eventually you know they were networking them together and all of that and so this is where things really get started now of course in in those days one of the problems was we we lived in what was called a peer to peer network so what would happen is these computers were you could network these computers together with various technologies but um, there was no centralization, meaning each computer was equal. There was no computer that controls all the other computers. A network admin would have to, uh, if they wanted to make changes, they'd have to sit down at each and every computer to make those changes or get users to help them, which was always a nightmare. Um, and so that didn't, you know, it worked, but it didn't work very efficiently. All right. Now, as we moved into the 1990s, there was a, a company. That kept that was gaining ground called Novell, Novell, and they had a product called Netware, which was the idea of that was to use a server that would help manage uh, machines and also allow people to share files easier. Whereas in a peer-to-peer -peer network back originally, these machines would have to share files with each other, and people would have to know each other's passwords. It just didn't work very well. Well, eventually, with the creation of the file server concept, you had a more powerful machine that you could share files on and all that. And eventually Novell even came out with the idea of a server that could manage other machines. Now this is kind of where Microsoft comes in. Microsoft created their product called NT and they created this uh, concept of a domain controller which is a special type of server that can manage these other servers. Now fast forward they came out with what was known as a domain but fast forward to the year 2000 Microsoft releases their newest domain technology and they call it uh, Active Directory and Active Directory domains were represented by a triangle alright and a domain controller was a a server essentially that had a database on it and that database was the Active Directory database so let's just kinda fix that here this little cylinder looking thing I'm gonna make here is gonna represent my Active Directory database so uh, AD alright um, and this was is what we still call to this day we call it ADDS Active Directory Domain Services and usually if you hear that term uh, Active Directory Domain Services it means it's an on-premise domain so anyway um, you would always want to have more than one domain controller you the reason you want to have more than one domain controller is because the same reason you have more than one of any type of, of server really one reason being um, to break up the disbursement of load these machines will authenticate with these domain controllers and the more machines you got uh, you know you don't want all of that just going to one domain controller right the other consideration is redundancy if you only have one and that server goes down well you're in trouble right so we want to have multiple the other thing about domain controllers that are interesting is that they replicate. So, uh, for example, let me make a, I'm going to make a little smiley face guy here, and this little smiley face guy is going to represent uh, my uh, user. 
So we create a user account on a domain controller. Now the interesting thing about user accounts, or the interesting thing really about domain controllers is that they replicate. So everything you do on one uh, will replicate over to the other. So if I create a user account on that first one, well, replication is gonna occur between uh, both of them. And so this little arrow thing I'm gonna make here is gonna represent replication. So domain controllers replicate. That means that this user could log on to any one of these thousands machine and it's gonna you know, authenticate with the uh, domain controller, all right? The authentication protocol that uh, is used is the protocol known as Kerberos, all right? Kerberos is the authentication uh, protocol. What is a protocol? It's like a language, basically, okay? Uh, now, there was an older protocol that, that, uh, that it also supported called NTLM. That was for legacy for older prior to the year 2000 machines. Now, the um, that protocol allowed us to have encrypted passwords and all that and authenticate securely and all that fun stuff. The other thing is, is Active Directory uses a language um, known as the Directory Service Language, and that language was called LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Now, all that is, again, this is all decades old at this point. Um, at the time when it came out, it was cutting edge, but it's, it is a bit dated nowadays. Uh, but it still works, and it's still pretty secure, though there are some considerations on security that I'm not going to explain right now. Now, the other thing that's important about Active Directory is that all machines have to have a name. And the name must be, of course, associated with an IP address and, and all of that. And so there is a service that we use that we use it on the Internet all the time called DNS, Domain Name Service. Our, our uh, domain must have a name. Usually when you name your domain, you would name it after your company, and a lot of people even name their domains based on their web presence. So, for example, my domain might be called examlabpractice.com. That's my company, my web presence. And um, I'm going to need to have a, a server in my domain that can associate the names and IP addresses together. So that server is called a DNS server. DNS, Domain Name System Server. And that server will also have to have a little database on it. And that database will be our DNS database. Okay. So we'll just draw another little cylinder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this, border it with red, and then I'm going to color code the database red, which means that this database, the DNS database, is associated with that name. Now what happens is our machines, clients, domain chores, we also might even have, let's, let's draw a file server over here. Pretty common that we have file servers in our environment. Okay, um, All of these machines would register with our DNS, all right? And this allows for the centralization of name resolution, meaning they register their IP addresses into this database, and then now, anytime a machine needs to find another machine, it can query DNS. So for example, these machines all have to authenticate by your domain controllers. They can query DNS and say, hey, DNS, do you know what the uh, address is of one of my domain controllers so I can authenticate? And DNS can reply back and say, yeah, here is the information. At that point, the client can go and authenticate. So it works very efficiently. Now, all of this together, this, this idea of domain controllers, this triangle you see here, this provides centralization. So we, we moved away from peer-to-peer -peer networking back in the day where you know, every machine was kind of its own boss and there was no centralized way of managing things to now we are working in a centralized environment. These domain controllers help us centralize. This DNS service help, helps us centralize. So we now have some central control over things. One of the great things about our uh, domain controllers too is we have these wonderful things called GPOs, group policy objects. A group policy object is this object that you can create that has all these settings, parameters, uh, you know, any type of attribute you want to configure or change on machines, you can do it through a GPO. So for example, if your boss walks up to you and says, hey, I want you to um, force the firewalls to be turned on all these machines. I want to make sure that the antivirus is always up to date. 
Uh, I want you to disable some of the, the wallpaper feature. I don't want people you uh, putting crazy wallpapers on their machine. Um, so, I mean, you could, the sky's the limit. There are literally thousands of things you can do inside of a GPO, but what happens is that GPO can instruct these machines to turn things on and turn things off. GPOs also replicate, so when you create a GPO on a domain controller, it replicates over to the other domain controller. So it doesn't matter which machines you know, authenticate with which domain controller. All right, so these GPOs can be deployed out to these machines, and this is how you turn things on, turn things off. You could even deploy software with that if you wanted to. So it was, a, it was very, very powerful, um, a very, very powerful system for managing everything. All right, uh, of course, let's let's throw the internet into the mix here. Let's say that this little cloud is going to represent the, uh, you know, the internet, and um, let's talk about kind of a little bit about how that sort of fits into the picture. Let me just clean it up here with the mighty stroke of my paintbrush. I will clean up the internet. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, so then we have the internet, right? So maybe we've got an internet connection that's coming in here. All right, and of course you don't want to just leave your internal network exposed, so your company would generally have a firewall, right? Um, and we would, we'll just put that firewall right here. And so now we have, um, you know, a secure way for traffic to flow out to the internet and uh, the only things that can come in would be things that we send out and we could allow things through that firewall if we want to. Now this is a traditional domain. This is the way we've done things for 20 years, all right? Um, and in this next little section I want to talk about uh, expansion on all of this and where where things have gone with things like RAS and all that and VPN and virtualization. So um, that'll wrap this little section up and we'll move on to the next. I now want to talk about some concepts that are also sort of the foundation of how we've done things over the years. It's important to understand how we've done things over the years so we can understand how uh, things are now. So looking back, we have an Active Directory domain, ADDS as it's called, Active Directory Domain Services, which uses the LDAP Lightweight Director Access Protocol, which uses Kerberos for authentication or for this older, for the legacy back in the 90s devices that used NTLM, a new technology land manager, which is, isn't all very new these days. But uh, even Kerberos is pretty old con uh, considering you know, we've been using it for, for decades, and I think actually the protocol even came out back in the 1980s. So, you know, so we got some data technologies, but the technologies have been updated, a lot of them over the years, to be secure. So you can still feel comfortable using those. But let's talk about some different scenarios now. Um, the first thing I want to look at is the scenario of what happens when we have a user who is not at the office. So this person is working from home. Working from home is a lot more popular nowadays than it has been in the past, so it's very common. And this person needs the ability perhaps to, you know, be able to connect in and access uh, services that are inside. Okay? Um, and we've got a file server, but, you know, ultimately we, we you probably are aware that, you know, in the past um, it was always this mindset of do it yourself, host your own server. So, you know, your companies might have, they might have a file server, but then they might also have a, um, you know, they might be, they might have a SQL database server that, that users need to access. Let's, let's create that SQL. All right. Um, maybe uh, Microsoft Exchange. That was email, right? Microsoft Exchange was, uh, you know, used for email, and then maybe even like SharePoint was very popular by Microsoft on-premise. So here you've got these, you know, these four servers providing a service to our devices, and um, you've got users working from home and everything else needing to get access to those. Let me just kind of move those a little bit over here, make a little bit of room here. 
and I'm going to shrink those down just a little bit as well. All right. So th this user who is working from home needs to access these services, but the person is not, uh, you know, not around. Well, let me tell you what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't just open up all the ports on the firewall and allow this person in to get access to these um, devices unsecurely. In fact, in the 90s, a lot of companies did that. The very first company I ever worked for uh, back in the 90s, they didn't really have a firewall, so you literally could share out your, you had a public address and uh, you could connect to it from home. It was really scary when I think about it. Even in the 90s, that was scary, but nowadays it's incredibly scary. Why is it scary? Because you got these people out there that want to do things that um, they shouldn't do and, and you know, get access to companies' data and, and try to do damage and ransom and all of that, ransomware and all that. And, and who are these people? Well, we, we generally call them hackers, right? So let me draw a little hacker. This, uh, this little, this little uh, box here is going to represent my hacker. All right, and let's make him let's make this hacker look like he's up to no good all right i'm just gonna i'm gonna give him like a let's give him like a devil horns some devil horns here and maybe like uh you know he's he's in a bad mood i'm gonna give him a frowny face and give him some fangs and maybe the fangs are dripping blood every okay no i'm just kidding <laughs> sorry sometimes i get carried away all right but uh anyway that's gonna be my hacker all right goofy looking little hacker person all right and um, so we don't want this hacker like spying on my user. We don't want this hacker getting access to resources inside. So how do we get around that? Well, usually the way we would do that is you would use a VPN, a virtual private network. So the way you would do that is you could purchase what was called a VPN concentrator. And basically it's a device that um, allows secure connections in. But in the Microsoft world, we actually had a type of server we could set up uh, called a RAS server or also known as an RAS server because it stood for routing and remote access services. But um, anyway, remote access services is the idea here. And with that, we have support for VPN. Now, what does that do? This allows this thing called a VPN tunnel to be created, which means that you have this encrypted communications that goes through to that RAS server. And then from there, that RAS server allows you to access other resources securely. This hacker will not be able to see the um, the traffic that's flowing through because it's all encrypted. The only thing the hacker would be able to see is that it was going up to this firewall and that would be it. Wouldn't be able to see what the traffic said. So this is how we would, we would definitely help secure things. Now, the other thing that I want to talk to you about here is what happens when a company needs to have a service that is exposed to the internet. For example, let's say that your company is going to host their own web server, okay? So you set up a web server, all right? Maybe this is gonna be www.examlabpractice.com or whatever, and people from the internet need to be able to get to it anonymously. Um, well, how are you gonna do that? Where are you gonna put that web server? Are you gonna put it internally? inside the domain like you see here. And the reason that's scary is because you would have to open up port 443, port 80, which is the HTTP, HTTP ports to allow traffic to get in, which means not only could you know somebody out there on the internet anonymously get into this web server, but technically so could a hacker. And if a hacker was ever to gain access over this website by hacking it, then something called pivoting could occur where a hacker could actually gain access to these other services that are on your network. And so that's where things are really scary. So you definitely won't want to host it internally most of the time, although there was a way to do something called a reverse proxy. I won't get into that right now. But we would probably want to put this outside, right? So we'd want to put it out here. Um, but there's something else that's a problem on that. If you put it outside that firewall, you don't have to worry about, you know, people getting, you know, allowing traffic to come in. But the only that the scary thing about that is the fact that this poor web server is now completely exposed to the internet, so with no protection. So the way around that usually is people would get another firewall. So you'd have two firewalls. This first firewall was would be called the uh, internal connected firewall, and then you, this firewall here would be called the external connected firewall. Now this little network between that, we would call that a DMZ 
demilitarized zone, or now the more popular term is perimeter network. Okay, so DMZ perimeter network are basically the same thing. All right, um, and so now what you would do is you'd only open you would only open the ports like port 80, 443, 53 for DNS if you put DNS in there. Uh, whatever ports there that you need and now traffic would be able to get to this web server okay um, and so uh, even if a hacker you know somehow hacks this web server you're not going to allow traffic to pass through this firewall and get to these resources the only traffic that you might allow would be VPN okay um, and, and there's a bunch of authentication and all that that has to happen to make that work all right, so that's the idea of remote access and VPNs in a nutshell for you, as well as the concept of DMZ and uh, the perimeter network idea. Uh, now, the, the final thing I want to look at with you um, in this video is the idea of virtualization. So I talked about how in the past, uh, it was always the, the mindset was we got to host everything ourselves. We got to have our own little data center. We got to have our, you know, we got to have our own servers, file server, SQL exchange, SharePoint, all that. And it's all got to be hosted by us. And that's the way things have always been done. All right. Um, now, uh, then what you'll find is, is as time went on, uh, a company called VMware came out with a uh, a way of expanding on virtualization. Just so you know, virtualization is not a new term. Virtualization has been around for a very long time. In fact, the term hypervisor is the essentially the software that lets us emulate hardware. And if you can emulate hardware, you can also store software on that emulated hardware. That's the idea of virtualization. Um, that term hypervisor has been around since the 1970s. The idea of even mainframes dividing up processing time and doing shared computing was a form of virtualization. So this is not a new concept, but VMware, they expanded on this idea and the and the, the thing that they did that really pushed the envelope on all this was that, hey, you don't necessarily need four different servers. And here's the other thing, here's the other crazy thing. If you wanted redundancy for those four servers, you'd really need eight servers, right? And you could do clustering those together. So you'd have eight servers to provide redundancy for those. But with, with uh, virtualization, I can set up a hypervisor server, one server, and, and, and virtualize those other servers. Now, in the Microsoft world, we call that Hyper-V. That is the, the software that does this, Hyper-V, hyper, Hypervisor. Uh, Microsoft's not the one that came up with that. VMware's not the first to ever come up with that. VMware was the biggest contributor to this concept, though, so I do have to give them credit where credit is due. All right, now the other beautiful thing, though, about this is you get a really, really powerful machine. You virtualize your um, machines on those. You get these things called um, checkpoints in Microsoft. They used to be called snapshots, and a lot of other companies still call them snapshots, where you can make changes without the worry of breaking anything because you can revert back to before the change was made. The other thing that's wonderful about um, using virtualization is if I want to com uh, have complete redundancy, I don't have to have eight servers. I could literally you know, purchase another server and have a copy of the virtual machines on that other server. Now I've only got two servers as opposed to having to have uh, a total of eight servers. Okay, so this is a very powerful feature capability that kind of uh, started everything. Another thing that we got, and, and this is kind of where you start thinking about cloud computing, is with virtualization comes the, the term elasticity, which basically means that each of these machines can be given a certain amount of RAM processing power. But here's what's interesting about that. If one of the servers isn't using all of the available RAM that it's been given, it can share it with other servers. So for example, this file server has been given more RAM than it needs and then SQL needs that RAM, the file server can give up some of that RAM over to SQL. And when SQL's done using that extra memory, it can release it back to everybody. It's basically a pool type scenario where it gets released into a pool of RAM and pool of CPU and they can grow and shrink as they need. And that's the, the, the small way of sort of uh, on-premise way of looking at elasticity. Of course, when you get into cloud computing, you'll learn that that can expand across multiple machines across the you know, the, the board in these big data centers. But 
not to get into that just yet here, but that's the idea. Hopefully that now helps you with understanding that concept of what virtualization is. And with that is really where, you know, cloud computing started to come into play, which I'm not explaining in this video, but hopefully now you have a much better understanding of the concept of, of the RAS VPN as well, the DMZ uh, concepts and virtualization. And now we'll, in this next section, we'll start getting into the concept of cloud services. So with the creation of virtualization, it got companies thinking, companies like Amazon and Google and Intel and IBM and eventually even Microsoft that, hey, we've got these massive data centers. Uh, why not? allow people to pay us to host their virtual machines on our data center. So in other words, we can get people to pay us money to host their virtual machines and they don't have to deal with all the headaches of dealing with everything on premise. So this is really the idea of where cloud services came from. And so I'm going to draw this kind of big cloud here. This is going to represent cloud computing, if you will. We'll have a connection coming down here, okay? And I will just kind of clean that up a little bit, make it somewhat look nice. So this being, you know, the big I, big thing is this is not an, a new concept of, if you think about humans as a whole, we have offered services for years. I know how to change the oil in my car, but I don't necessarily enjoy doing it. So I can pay a, uh, a mechanic shop um, the, the fee and they will do it for me as a service, right? Well, this is the idea of cloud services. So there's some acronyms I want to introduce you to, the first one being the term IAAS, and that is infrastructure as a service. So infrastructure as a service means the cloud provider is offering their infrastructure for a fee as a service, okay? So the idea being something like this, instead of me having to host my virtual machines and all that in my on-premise environment, I can pay this cloud company to host virtual machines for me. They can also host a virtual network for you. They can host, uh, they can have storage that's uh, offered to you. They can have firewalls, virtual firewalls that are associated on those virtual networks and virtual load balancers, okay? They can have apps out there that are available. They can have virtual databases that are hosted in the cloud. So essentially just about anything you could imagine that you can host on premise can be hosted out there in the, the cloud service. Uh, now, Amazon, Google, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, these various companies offer this Microsoft's cloud service uh, that does this, their, their IAAS service is called Azure. Now, let me just kind of clarify, you may pronounce that name, that word a little different than I do, Azure or Azure or Azure. Actually, years ago when I was first learning Azure, I actually went to uh, the internet and started watching videos of the developers that created Azure and the first few developers that I watched, that's how they pronounced it. They pronounced it Azure. So that's how I just assumed that it needed to be pronounced. Of course, I learned later down the road that not all the developers even agree on how to pronounce that word. Some of them pronounced it Azure, Azure, uh, Azure. I've even heard somebody pronounce it Azure. So this is one of those tomato, tomato, pronounce that word any way you want to pronounce it. That's how I say it, which is Azure. Okay. So Azure is Microsoft's official um, inner infrastructure as a service. And the way that it all works is you pay a fee for what you use every month. Basically, how much CPU, memory, storage, network, all of that that you use, that's what you're going to pay for. Okay, now there are some other terms, uh, other uh, acronyms that I want to introduce you to. There is an acronym called PAAS, which stands for Platform as a Service, and an acronym called SAAS, which is Software as a Service. Now, the, uh, the, uh, the idea there being that there are, well, we'll start with, uh, with Software as a Service first. 
software as a service, the idea is that there is a fully functional app or application that is 100% ready for you to start using or your users to start using. All you got to do is just jump right in and start using it. Okay, so there are some uh, Azure services that are software as a service. There's also what are called platforms as a service. Now, platform as a service is kind of a, uh, there's a little bit more work involved from an admin standpoint. So a platform as a service means there is a some type of software platform that is available for you to start using and it's 100% ready for you to use, but you have to go and administer it and use it before it's going to really do anything. Uh, a good example of this is Microsoft's directory services in the cloud is called Intra-ID. Intra-ID. All right which I want to make, it's very important that you realize that this was formally called Azure AD and there's still a lot of documentation out there that refers to this as Azure AD. So it's very important that, uh, that you are aware of that. Now you are taking my course right now and you should realize that um, I have hundreds of hours of videos that still may, that I've, I've got to update that involve that term Azure AD. There are literally hundreds of hours that I have recorded using the term Azure AD and I'm in the process of updating videos but be aware that I don't have them all upgraded. So you may hear me refer in the course to stuff as Azure AD. I actually have a video on this for you to watch after these foundation videos. It's a video that says do not skip. So please do not skip that video. Make sure you watch that video because it's going to talk about this name change. So anyway, the name is now Intra ID. It's just a name change. They changed it to Azure AD. The services are pretty much all the same. It's just a name change. Okay, so Intra ID is a platform as a service. Now it is Microsoft's directory services. This is where your user accounts and passwords and groups and permissions, role permissions and all that are all managed through Intra ID, formerly Azure AD, okay? Um, whereas on premise in a domain, we called it ADDS, Active Directory Domain Services. All right, I think that's part of the reason Microsoft changed the name to kind of distinguish the difference between the on-premise uh, Active Directory and the former Active Directory, Azure AD, to Intra ID. Anyway, um, this platform as a service is ready for you to use, but there's only like one user, and that's the admin, and then you're responsible for going in there as an admin and adding users and controlling things. That's why it's a platform as a service. It's not... 100% ready uh, set up. You have to administer it. Now, Microsoft's main uh, platform as a service uh, functions and software as a service, they have something called Microsoft 365. So there's really two parts to the Microsoft Cloud Service. There's Azure, uh, which is mostly focused on the IaaS side things. And don't get me wrong, in Azure there are also some platform as a services and software as a services, but it's mostly geared towards IaaS. Whereas Microsoft 365 is mostly geared towards platform as a service. Now these two are very related. Microsoft 365 sits on top of Azure. You can't have Microsoft 365 without Azure. And if you create an Azure account, then it'll allow you to automatically create a Microsoft 365 account. So these are all related. You're not just going to create an Azure account or not just going to create a Microsoft 365 account. They're pretty much linked together. Okay. Now, in the Microsoft 365 services, you have lots of platform as a services and software as a, as a service. For example, uh, we have the what are called the Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise, which that was formerly called Office 365, and that's the downloadable version of off the, the Microsoft 365 apps, formerly the Office 365 apps like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all of that. And there is also something called Office for the web. Now that is fully a software as a service. The, uh, the Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise, that is actually a mix. It's a platform as a service and a software as a service. Most people refer to it as a software as a service because they're downloadable apps. But as an admin, from an admin standpoint, we have to administer that. So the administration side of it is platform as a service. Uh, Office for the web is 100% software as a service. These are web-based versions of the Office apps that are ready for you, for your users to use. They get Once they get a license, they can use it. Okay, then we have 
exchange online. Okay, so the administration side of that is a platform as a service, but the user side of that is a software as a service, right? And then we've got SharePoint online, which is the same idea. It's a, you know, admin side is a platform as a service, but the user side, which is what most everybody focuses on, is a uh, software as a service. We have Microsoft Teams, same thing for that, okay? Um, you know, for, for messaging and, and all of that fun stuff, we have... Uh, a product called Intune, which is an incredibly powerful product, uh, mobile device management, mobile uh, application management. Intune is what is sort of taking the place of GPOs in the cloud. So on premise, we could control the settings and parameters and attributes, and we could deploy software and all that using GPOs on premise. Well, now when it comes to the cloud service, we can use Intune. We can actually control on premise machines from Intune. So it is very, very powerful, an incredibly powerful product. Then we've got we've got OneDrive for Business. OneDrive for Business is a cloud-based storage that users can have access to. So anyway, there there's actually so many products that are cloud-based products. There's no way I could put them all in here, but here's some of the main, you know, main things. Now, as far as the licensing and, and all of that, with Azure you are paying for what you use, CPU, RAM, storage, and network. But for the Microsoft 365 services, you have what are called subscriptions, and you purchase a subscription with a certain amount of licenses. So if, for example, if I purchase a Microsoft 365 subscription, I can purchase a certain amount of licenses, and I can issue those out to my users, and I will pay a monthly fee for however many licenses that I've got with my subscription. Okay, and that's just a, a giving you a basic understanding of how that works exactly. Okay, so ultimately, though, if I could kind of color code this, uh, we'll say that, you know, the, the Azure side of this, IaaS, and again, Azure does have some platform as a service stuff as well as software as a service, but it's mostly geared to be a I, uh, infrastructure as a service. And then the uh, Microsoft 365 is mostly platform as a service, software as a service. So if I was to kind of draw a... Um, you know, kind of just draw around these, we would say that the these right here are all geared towards Microsoft 365. And then this, these are geared towards the infrastructure service, which is Azure. And both of these, Azure and Microsoft 365, they share intra-ID. They share intra-ID, okay? Yellow, or uh, red and blue make purple, right? <laughs> okay. So they actually, um, you create users in the Azure side or the Microsoft 365 side, you're going to see the same users because they are linked together. They share the same directory service. So it's important to understand that. Now, the other piece of this is what about situations where you want to link all this together? So it's not uncommon nowadays for companies, you know, to have this triangle, to have this uh, on-premise domain, and then also start utilizing Microsoft's cloud services. Um, and then, you know, in the for years and years, they've always pushed this thing called SSO. SSO is single sign-on, where you have a, a user has a user account, and that user account gives them access to everything they need. Well, we don't get SSO if you have to have a user account to access things in your domain and then a different user to access things in the cloud, right? Well, Microsoft has ways around that. They actually have uh, services that you can use for linking these together. And that service, let me just kind of move some of this around a little bit so I can make a little bit more room. We'll put the DNS server there. We'll move this little RAS server down over here. And the server is called Intra Microsoft Intra Connect. And it was formally formally Azure AD Connect. Okay. So then so again it's called Intra Connect now and it used to be called Azure AD Connect. And um, I'm definitely I, I like to refer to it with the old name as well, just because be advised you really kind of need to know the old name as well, because there's still a lot of documentation that will refer to this as the older name. The newer name is IntraConnect. The the older name is is uh, Azure AD Connect. But this was a server you could set up on premise, and what it would do is it'll synchronize your user accounts 
out to the cloud. So your on-premise user accounts would get synchronized. So whatever users you have on-premise, and you don't have to synchronize them all, you could pick and choose which one you synchronize, but your user accounts are gonna sync out to intra-ID. And now what'll happen is, you have this thing called seamless SSO, where when your users log on to the domain, it logs them on in both places. They log on to the on-premise domain as well as in the cloud, which is really, really cool. Now that is a heavier weight version. There is actually a, um, a lighter weight version that's a very, very lightweight application. You don't actually have to dedicate a server to it like they kind of want you to with Inter uh, Connect. There is actually another lighter weight tool called uh, IntraSync or IntraID Sync, which is a lighter weight. Now there's some pluses and minuses to go in either route, which I'm not gonna get into right now, but the uh, the traditional way to do this was to use uh, this here, IntraConnect, formerly Azure AD Connect. Now the other thing I'll tell you is this does not sync back. So it would sync users out, but it won't sync users that are created out in the cloud back to on-premise. You cannot currently do that. You can't synchronize users that are created in intra ID down here but any users can be synced out and it'll even make it where if they change their password like out in the cloud it'll it'll sync that as well so anyway that kind of gives you a, a rundown of that now I'll also tell you that Microsoft is moving away from domains in fact if you um, if, if you've got an on-premise domain like like what you see here, then yeah, it's a great idea to, to utilize this. But if you're a new company, and this really pains me to say it because I have um, fed my family for over two decades by, by not only teaching about Active Directory on-premise, but also implementing Active Directory on-premise as a consultant. Um, and so it kind of pains me to say this, but as a consultant now, I'm not even recommending that newer companies implement a domain anymore. Um, a lot of companies are now moving to the cloud and there's ups and downs of that. But to be honest with you, in most cases, your co a company gets out cheaper by utilizing uh, cloud services, okay? Um, and so nowadays you can actually set up on-premise machines and manage them through Intune and things like that that are in the cloud. You can even have client machines hosted in the cloud, but I'm not gonna dive into that right now. Uh, ultimately though, if you are a company that's been around for a while, then the traditional approach that you see here where you've got a, a domain um, and then you're starting to move into the cloud, you can set up IntraConnect, formerly Azure AD Connect, uh, or Intra ID Sync, and, which is the lighter weight version, and you can have things synchronized out to the cloud. All right. All right, well, hopefully these foundation videos have been instruct, instructional to you. I hope you got a lot out of this and you're ready to move on. I want to make sure we have an understanding of what the term XDR is, if you're not familiar with it. Now, I want to show you too, Microsoft has a great article about this. Uh, if we do a quick Google or Bing search on Microsoft 365 Extended Detection Response, you can find this article right here. If we go to that, Microsoft kind of breaks this down and I want to show you some visualization couple drawings and make sure that we uh, have an understanding of what this is. All right. Now, the first thing to understand again is that, um, that Microsoft Defender is classified in a, as an XDR. XDR is not, this is not a term that is just Microsoft. There are other products out there that do this, but Microsoft 365 Defender is an XDR. Okay. So what is, the, what is the concept here? What exactly is this bringing to the table? You know, why do we care about it? The way to think about this, about this type of thing is look at it from the standpoint of holistic. The concept of holistic security involves that you have the sum of, of multiple parts that equal a whole and in understanding the big picture of security, cybersecurity in your environment is very important. So when you think about the aspect of the fact that we have hardware in our out there that we're working with, it's got to, to have updates and uh, be monitored. It's got logs. We've got um, devices in our environment that our users are using, client devices, server devices. All of these have operating systems. They need updates. They need to be monitored. And then we also have applications that have to be updated and monitored. 
all of this stuff has logs. Then you start thinking about cloud. You start looking at virtual machines and these virtual services from things like virtual firewalls and virtual load balancers uh, on top of virtual applications. You get into the Microsoft 365 environment, Office 365, and you know your head starts to explode when you think about, or at least mine does, when you start thinking about how many components we're dealing with both in the physical realm on premise and then in the digital realm we start thinking about the cloud service world things just get crazy so we have to think about um, how in the world are we going to secure all of the these services well the first thing to think of is you really need a technology that can get its little tendrils as I like to say in every aspect of those components the hardware the software grabbing logs and pulling it together so we know you know seam or sim as some people like to call it security and event and information management right um, when you think about that you have a technology that can go out there and just grab all these logs and, and pull them in centrally but um, those products not all of them some of them but a lot of them don't actually uh, perform actions against things that they detect. They don't run. Uh, they don't run in incident-based actions and all of that um, in your environment. So what XDR does, and of course Microsoft 365 Defender again is an XDR. It is monitoring all of these things. All right, as you can see, it's extended in from hybrid identities, you know, on-premise to email to your cloud applications to all your endpoints, those are your devices, even IOTs involve Internet of Things, uh, data loss prevention, you have all of this linked together, all right, with the ability to perform detection analysis with the help of threat intelligence, Microsoft's threat intelligence team, which of course is well over 3,000 people in the, in the world that are constantly looking for the latest and greatest threats and then putting those threats in the, in the databases that are out there. Of course, there's the C CVE database out there and the sticks and all these different databases that Microsoft is pulling from that are worldwide. But being able to detect those threats and then provide a response for those threats, um, that is the idea of XDR, okay? If you work for an organization, maybe you're part of a SOC, a security operations center or whatever, this is an invaluable set of tools that's going to uh, let us uh, basically leverage in order to discover the latest and greatest threats that are out there. It's a unified tool for identifying and detecting the various types of threats and then of course taking action on those threats that we've got. Let's, let me show you a couple of drawings now. Now as you can see here with Microsoft 365 Defender being the XDR in the Microsoft 365 world we have the ability of linking Defender for Identity, Defender for Office 365, Defender for Endpoint, Defender for Cloud Apps, and of course, just like we're doing uh, here, we can have a little lab where we can evaluate all of this and play around with all this, and we can utilize the techniques that uh, Defender for Identity offers, the uh, Office 365, Defender for Endpoint, Cloud Apps. We can investigate and respond from all of those products, all of those components, all right? And then from there, we can decide where to go. We can act on any issues that we run across involving uh, any of these components where uh, threats have been detected and, uh, and need to be dealt with. The other thing, of course, if we come back over here, here's another kind of way to look at it. Um, with Microsoft 365 Defender, you know, we have we can have an incident queue in which different incidents have been discovered and they can be prioritized based on a low, medium, or high based uh, incident reporting system. Uh, our SOC, if we have a security operations center, or it could just be a couple of cybersecurity professionals, uh, or in a smaller environment, it might literally just be one IT person that deals with all of this. Um, but we can provide automated responses to help stop these attacks. We have self-healing capabilities with this as well. Self-healing for uh, compromised devices, user identity as mailboxes. We have cross-product threat hunting. So, you know, when you start thinking about things like Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps and all of that, 
how it kind of monitors all these various applications at one time, and that's going to link back to Defender for Endpoint, Defender for Identity, uh, which links, of course, to our on-premise devices. So not only is this, you know, monitoring the stuff that's in the cloud, it's also keeping track of the stuff that is uh, is on-premise. And um, we have threat analytics, too, that kind of helps us get a feel for, you know, which devices or applications or users in general are continuously getting uh, threats. As, you know, in, in all organizations, if you've been in IT a while, you, you always have at least one private, uh, one problem child, as I like to call them. This is one person that seems to just always be doing, you know, things are getting messed up in their environment, on their computer, and their, their device, or they're, they're getting viruses constantly, they're getting hacked constantly. You know, it's, it's important for us to figure out um, the common denominator here, the who is that problem child, and why is that person or those people, sometimes you got more than one, in most environments you will have more than one, especially if they're bigger, uh, why is that person constantly the one that's getting uh, the, the malware, or getting targeted by hackers or whatever. But this type of thing can help us figure that out. All of these, and this is really the point of XDR, they all are linked together and they share security signals. So all of these, Microsoft Defender for Office 365, Defender for Identity, Defender for Endpoint, Cloud App Security, uh, which actually has been renamed to Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps. Be advised that sometimes even though this, this is an updated, this diagram came from an updated page from Microsoft, they don't always update the artwork. But uh, it's called Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps now. And then Azure Identity Protection, this has actually been changed to Intra-Identity uh, intra Protection now. So that name has changed also because Azure AD has been has been renamed to Intra ID, right? Um, but anyway, this ties to when you start thinking about, uh, if you look down here, you can see of Exchange Online Protection as well. Exchange Online Protection is something you just get with Exchange Online, but it can work hand in hand with uh, the Defender for Office 365, okay? You have Azure AD or Intra ID as it's called now, uh, intra ID uh, is is being protected with the help of Microsoft Defender for Identity as well as Identity Protection, Intra Identity Protection, and then here is uh, Azure AD again, Intra ID, which links back to our on-premise act, premise Active Directory. Keep in mind that on-premise Active Directory is actually still called Active Directory. The on-premise version of this did not get renamed. It is still called Active Directory. Okay, so ultimately I hope uh, this video has helped you get a better understanding of just what XDR is, okay, extended detection and response, and how Microsoft Defender is Microsoft's official XDR product. I'd like to now talk about the uh, action and submissions area of Microsoft Defender. So here we are on portal.microsoft.com. We're going to click Show All, click Security. That's going to bring us into Microsoft 365 Defender. Once we get into Defender, we're going to see an area right here called Actions and Submissions. So we're going to go ahead and drop that down. And the first thing you'll see is what's called the Action Center. And this is going to show if any action has t been taken uh, against anything that has been submitted. And right now, nothing has been submitted. Now, if we go down to Submissions, you can see that we have the ability to submit various things. We can submit emails, we can submit um, team messages, email attachment, URLs, files, and user reporting. Okay, so there's various things we can do there and we can um, send those to be submitted and then analyzed. So now what I want to do is scroll down under here where it says endpoints and don't forget I do need to have a Defend for Endpoint license for this to show up. Um, but anyway, I am going to drop down where it says evaluation and tutorials, and I'm going to go to tutorials and simulations. And Microsoft has got some um, various like simulations you can play around with. And keep in mind this does periodically change, so um, you hopefully you if you're doing this with me, you can do the same thing as me. But ultimately, you just need a file that you can test. So Microsoft has one right here. Document drops a back door. Uh, simulates a delivery of a social engineer to lure documents. We're just going to download this file, get simulation file, and it is going to download the file right there. Okay, and um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to now go back up here to action and submissions, go to submission, 
and then I'm going to go right here to files and we're going to say add new submission browse okay I've submitted the file right here or I've uh, added the file I should say tells you what the maximum file size can be submit only one file at a time this file should have been categorized what I want to categorize it as and I'll say possibly malware uh, choose the priority low medium or high uh, this needs uh, immediate attention okay notes and anything else you would like to add um, this is for a simulated demonstration since I am just doing this as a demonstration uh, and then I can share feedback and then I'm gonna click submit are you sure you want to submit yes and so at that point we have now submitted this file tells you your submission has been submitted to Microsoft now analysis we'll get back to you with the results soon all right so also so the next thing here is you'll notice it even gives me an option here I can say create an indicator if I want which brings me uh, over here uh, to our little dashboard in, Defend in Defender and walks you through responding to threats and, and all of that I can click next it basically just does the little tutorial for for doing that but if I come back over here now uh, to the Action Center you're gonna notice that the action still there's no actions that have happened yet and the reason is because we've done a submission but um, there is no uh, the submission hadn't come back from Microsoft yet so it'll, it'll run an analysis of course the funny thing is they're kind of running an, al an analysis on their own file because I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes but if I am on the Action Center I can look at history and you can see um, like it's got quarantine file and this was from the little test machine uh, from playing around with the little test machine so I can click on those you can see um, the little quarantine that it did and I can say op you know, open investigation page is going to pull up that investigation uh, information about that file I can see the alerts that were generated alright so hopefully you're getting an idea here of what this action and submissions is all about it gives me an opportunity to submit um, and then based on the submission that I get back I can I can perform actions against it ultimately it can also do automated actions where in the case of uh, uh, your your users submitting it can perform automatic uh, investigations to get that keep in mind that users do have the ability to submit things themselves within products like teams and outlook when they when they see problems in fact if I jump back into my uh, outlook Microsoft 365.com I've got this little uh, email that was uh, done with a with the simulation testing where it's a simulated password uh, attack essentially where a user is trying to social or a hacker would be trying to social engineer you into clicking this link and uh, if he so this would be like what a user could do a user could go right here uh, the user can go to report and they can say report phishing phishing messages designed to obtain your information by impersonating uh, let's just file links and body so it's just kind of reminding the user what that is and then you would click OK and then that would be submitted right now again a user can do this in teams and, and um, apps like that as well if they've noticed something out of the ordinary now if we come back over to Defender this will eventually show up under user reported now I will warn you that this can take a while so don't be expecting to just click on this and then immediately see it showing up okay um, but eventually it will all right uh, again we can also go back over to files and we should be able to see the what we submitted it as you can see it's still pending Microsoft hasn't reviewed it yet um, but you know from there uh, you do have the ability to take action whenever that's discovered if you want in fact if you do a quick Google or Bing search on the term view and manage actions in the Action Center Microsoft even shows you right here when something comes back showing malware um, you can open investigation where you investigate which users might have been affected by it 
you can approve an action that's being taken you can reject a pending action and so what are what are some of these things we can do uh, these action sources automated investigation uh, Microsoft Defender antivirus or manual response action and here's the supported act, uh, actions isolate a device so you're gonna cut ties that device is gonna be cut ties from communicating with other devices in the Microsoft 365 restrict code execution stop it from running any code quarantine the file remove a registry key stop a service on the machine disable a driver or remove a scheduled task so those are your various actions that you can that can be supported and then you can also undo actions as well okay so once something's been submitted you can perform those steps and then of course the action center will show what actions have been taken okay again we haven't gotten anything back from Microsoft yet on our file so at this point we can't take any action yet but um, that's the main thing to remember what they're telling you right here these are the actions that can be taken I want to spend some time now talking about using advanced hunting techniques with the help of KQL which is called Custo Query Language so let's take a look at that together now here we are on portal.microsoft.com if we click show all and then uh, go to the security blade that's going to bring us into Microsoft Defender and then we're going to drop down right here where it says hunting and we're going to click on advanced hunting this is going to bring us into where we can perform uh, Custo query language queries here in uh, the Microsoft 365 Defender environment now the first thing we'll notice right here is we're on a tab called schema and then below there you're gonna see these various tables the, this is actually if you think about it in uh, Microsoft 365 Defender what's happening is uh, it's able to collect information from all the various sources in Azure so that's Azure and that's Microsoft 365 that involves Microsoft 365 uh, for identity it involves Microsoft um, 365 Defender for endpoint uh, Defender for cloud apps um, you know all the various versions of Microsoft 365 Defender all rolled into one it goes into these various tables and of course it's nice that Microsoft gives us these graphical dashboards and all that that show us things in an easy uh, to use manner but what happens in a situation where you're not able to find the exact information you're looking for because Microsoft doesn't provide it in their graphical dashboards well that's where the Custo query language comes in that's where it's going to help us now you don't have to be a you know grandmaster guru or expert on uh, KQL for what we're doing here but there is some basic fundamental things I want to look at help you understand and you can also go deeper into this if you want the first thing I'll show you is that if you go out to Google or Bing and just do a quick search on Microsoft KQL you're gonna come across this link right here if we go into that Microsoft gives us a nice little overview of the Custo query language and uh, they talk about the basics of it and they give some examples and you can also go and take a look at their syntax articles over here where they break down the syntax and uh, and help you understand the the different um, operators and filters and all of that but I'm gonna I'm gonna show you some of the the basics there things to be aware of we'll run a few queries we'll get a good foundation of it and then if you want to dig deeper into it you can okay also you can do a, a Google or Bing search on uh, Custo query languages for Defender and they've got a few uh, references on that as well but let's jump back over in here and the first thing I want to show you is again these are your various tables you can look at right so I can go through here if I want and I can go to these various tables and then I can uh, I can run a query they've even got um, right here if I look uh, some basic queries that we can see for examples like this one called top uh, if I double click on this you'll see um, that it just throws up a quick query that we could perform um, regarding that uh, there we go actually I think I had a query already yeah there we go so then I can I could run that query if I want and get a quick response if there is any data and this is actually searching the cloud apps events table so I don't have any events in cloud apps right now but you can see 
that it says where the timestamp is greater than one day ago, essentially. And then um, it's going to sort that data. So it's going to grab that data and sort it by top 10 um, by timestamp and description. So the important thing to understand here is that, let me just go a little below here. What you've got is you've got your data source, okay? And then below that, you have a pipe symbol. Now the pipe symbol means that you want to use all the the current rows in this command. And if you're not familiar with pipelining, pipelining is a, a thing that we've had with commands for decades and decades. And the idea is you want to think of of a, a command is okay, I want to perform this, I want to grab this information, and then the contents of the information that I grab are going to go down this pipeline, right? And uh, so this little symbol is the pipe symbol. And then whatever comes after this pipe symbol means I want to perform some kind of action against the information that's in the pipeline. And this, this action can be a filter or it can be a modifier of some kind. It's going to modify the data or it can be a limiter, which means, hey, I want to limit a certain amount of data. And you can, this can happen, you can have lots of these and the end result when you get to the end of the pipeline is going to be what happens. You're going to get the output. So if you look at our example that we've got right here, you can see that the table we're looking at is the cloud events table, cloud app events table. And so that basically means, hey, I want you to, and if you just, if you just um, told it to hit the cloud events table by itself, you're just basically saying grab everything. The problem is you're grabbing, you could be grabbing in a large environment, especially you could be grabbing so much information. You need to filter that. So you're taking, you're grabbing the data and then you're saying, okay, in this pipeline, I want to say where the timestamp is greater than, and that you're saying a go, and then in parentheses, that's actually performing a, what's called a method, which means I want to look at um, a certain time period ago, in this case, one day. 1D means one day. So you're grabbing the data, you're performing this action first, and then the output that that would generate is going to go to the next part of the pipeline, which says top 10, show me the top 10, and then I want to sort this by timestamp and then description. So that essentially is what you're doing there, okay? Um, you're grabbing all that information, all right? So um, now, if I if I wanted to see device info, um, like let's say I wanted to look at device logons, logon events, I could say device logon events, right? So I've got a device logon events table, and just you know by itself. I could just run that and you're just saying grab everything. So you can see that we've now grabbed everything regarding device logon events. In my case, I've got uh, an NYCCL1 machine that I've played around with and a test machine that I've played around with. All right. So also, so you know, imagine though if you did this in a very large environment, you had thousands of thousands of, of uh, events. I mean, you could even be hundreds of thousands of events. This could take forever. As you can see, it didn't take long. Here's the latency right here. But this could take forever. Now, one thing you can do is if you wanted to see, you know, how many uh, entries we've got there, we could say count. All right. Uh, pipe that over to count and then run that query and it's just going to return a, a count. Um, in most queries, though, the good news is when you run it, it will actually um, list the count right here. But if you you can imagine if you had hundreds of thousands of events, it would take forever to display all this. If you just put pipe count, you could display how many events very quickly without it loading all the events up on the screen. So that's why that's going to be uh, valuable to you. Okay. The other thing I'll say that's uh, that's you'll you'll sometimes use when you're working with this is sometimes you'll declare variables you'll have variables that you'll display like um, a variable is a keyword that's going to store some information up in memory and then it can be displayed when you want it to so like I could the, I could do that right now the command to to store a variable is the let command so I could say let and we'll just say I'll call the variable some word 
Um, oh, and uh, well, so some word is our variable, and we're going to say equals, and then what word do we want to put in there? I'll, I'll say um, John Christopher. Okay. Whenever you declare a variable with the Cousteau query language, you end that with a semicolon. And then if I wanted to display that variable, I could say print, and I'll say some word, and then I'm just going to run that query, and it's just going to display my name. So when you're writing queries, if you needed to display, if you needed to put some kind of variable in there, you could uh, you could do that. And I'll show you another example of that, a more sophisticated example of that here in just a moment. Okay. Let's say I wanted to um, I wanted to look at device registry events on my devices. So uh, of course, don't forget you could search. So if you wanted to search for device registry, you could find the table and all that. So that's the other thing is I already know what some of these tables are, but if you wanted a keyword search them, you could. Um, you know, so again, I could say device registry. Let's say device registry if I was trying to find a specific one. So there it is right there. Double click on that. It's going to type it in here. So that's going to be our table. And then I'm going to say... Um, well, if, if we just if we just play that, if we just run that query, it's going to grab a lot of information again. We got 5,657 items. That's not too bad, but in a very large environment, this thing could be collecting insane amounts of data. And it's actually, in my case, doing this from a machine called Test Machine 3, which is a Windows 11 machine. But um, now watch this. I'm going to say take, so pipe, and I'm going to say take 100, all right? And then what we'll do, if we just say take 100 and, and play that, all right, we'll go ahead and run that query. You can see it just displays 100, right? But now what we'll do is we're going to say, let's do this. Let's, um, let's say sort by, and you can see it gives you some um, IntelliSense here. We'll say timestamp. So we got, let's do, let's do device info. Let's see what we get. So if we do device info and we just run a query against the device info table, what do we get? All right, so I get 59 items and it shows me device info and here's all this data, right? And I may not need all of that data. So um, another thing I can do is I can say, I can use a command called um, project. But let's first, let's say, take 100, okay, and we'll say project, and that means only show me. I only want to see the device, let's do device uh, ID, and we'll say, uh, you can do comma, and then you can do device, we'll say name, comma, and then we'll say OS platform, all right. And that'll be our query. So let's go ahead and run that. And there you go. See, it's only displaying that. So see how beneficial that is, how helpful that could be to us? All right. Um, so you can really uh, you can really get down and dirty with this. You can pull, you know, get lots of information on this. Um, if I wanted to see logon events, I don't think I've probably generated any identity logon events yet. Let's just see. But I want to show you something that, that could come in handy in a production environment. Let's see how many, yeah. So I haven't got any real logon events yet. And the reason I don't is because I don't have the auditing logon events capability because I'm not set up in a domain. But if you were in a domain, if your machines were in a domain, you would actually get this. So, but I want to show you a couple of things with this. Um, first off, if I wanted to I could say uh, identity uh, log on events, and I can join uh, data together. So I can say join kind equals enter, and then um, I'll say identity info. All right, and I'm going to say on object ID. Okay, so. Uh, I'm basically saying I want to pull identity info inside of the account object ID. So it's going to show me identity uh, logon events data, but it's going to pull 
identity info for that data and then the account object ID and display that on the screen. Um, again, I don't have any um, log on events to show, but I wanted to show that I could do that. Now watch this, I could do, I could also say identity log on events where timestamp is greater than a go one hour and that would show me events that have happened in the past hour, which of course we know is none, right? But the main thing to get here is some of this is trial and error. Go out there, do some uh, Google or Bing searching, and uh, you'll be surprised at the kind of stuff you'll find. Also, I'll tell you that ChatGPT is also very fantastic at helping with this. You can actually go into ChatGPT and you can ask it. You can say, I want to know, I want some specific data in Microsoft Defender. Um, write me a KQL query that would help me. So I want to encourage you to try that out as well. If you have access to ChatGPT, you can write queries that way as well. But ultimately, definitely kind of you want to skim through some of uh, some of their query syntax, get a get some practice in with it. You don't have to be a grandmaster guru of KQL for what we're doing here, but um, practice with a little bit, get some hands-on experience, and uh, and you'll be fine. Now inside of Microsoft Defender, Microsoft gives us something called the Secure Score, which can definitely help us with improving our security posture. First off though, what is security posture? Security posture is something that we have to maintain and uh, stay on top of over time on strengthening our security. The, the best way to look at it would be if you think about it, if you went and implemented all the security controls that we're learning about to strengthen your environment, and then let's say you uh, got in a time machine and went two years in the future, well, you probably wouldn't even have to do two years, you could go one month in the future in some cases, but two years into the future, and let's say you did not make any changes to your environment in two years to improve your security, you would have terrible security posture. So you'd have you start out with good security posture, and then if you didn't do anything to maintain that in two years, you would have terrible security posture because there are different types of attacks and threats that are being discovered every day, and we gotta stay on top of it. We gotta we gotta maintain it. All right. So let's take a look at our secure score in Microsoft Defender. So here we are on portal.microsoft.com. We're gonna click Show All. We're gonna go down to Security. That's going to bring us into Microsoft Defender. And then once we get into Microsoft Defender, you're going to see a blade called Secure Score. So we'll click on Secure Score. And then that brings us right here. And you can see uh, what your current score is. Your current score is probably not going to be super duper high yet because over time you have to implement and uh, take action in order to strengthen it. So you can see my score is, uh, is 61.65. Now, how does it determine what the score is going to be? Well, the first thing it does is it looks at all of the components and resources that you have available based on all of the licenses and subscriptions you have in Microsoft 365 and Azure. From there, uh, Microsoft has a bunch of uh, recommended actions that they have for each individual resource in Azure in Microsoft 365. And it looks to see if you have actually implemented any of those. And then based on the things that you've implemented, it gives you a, a, a score based on that. And it also compares your environment to other environments that are about the same size as yours in order to determine what your score is going to be. So you can see uh, my identity score, data, device, and apps. And then it, of course, um, takes all that into account when it creates the uh, official score. You can also see if you have regressed in any way. Uh, you can see how many uh, uh, items I need to address, whether I've got things planned, planned actions, risk uh, accepted, recent activity, or I'm sorry, recently added, and then recently updated. So here's all the top recommended actions. I can also click on these and see the individual ones. So you can see here, ensure multi-factor authentication is enabled for all users ensure multiple device management policies are set um, to require advanced security configurations. Now, I my score kind of goes up and down because as I teach these different courses, uh, I'm changing things to a stronger security or sometimes I lower the security so that I can show that I'm going to change it to a higher security. So you can see that my, um, my uh, score kind of 
ups and goes up and down. I can look at the history and it gives me a nice little graph that shows what my score is over time and uh, date time stamps for the various activities that, uh, that we've got. And in this case, this activity improved, it gave me uh, eight points and I can click on what that was, set remote desktop level to transport layer security. That was an improvement. Now, the great thing to me about this is you can go to recommended actions and you can see the things that it recommends. Then if you click on the recommended actions, it will even provide you with the description of that and then how you can go about implementing it. It'll provide you documentation and in a lot of cases, it'll even give you a step-by-step -step solution as to what you should do to strengthen your security. So this is really helpful that not only do they tell you what the problem is, but they try to assist you with actually fixing and solving the, uh, the actual problem itself. Okay. You can also do searches. So if you're looking for a specific, um, a specific item, like if I'm trying to search multi-factor right now, I got multi-factor uh, enabled, so it's not showing that. Um, BitLocker, if I'm trying to find something on BitLocker, I can do a search, but you can also just see all the items there that are available. All right, so you've also got metrics and trends. It's uh, I'm such a small environment, I don't have a lot of metrics and trends to show, but it would it would give me a, a, a some data here in a larger environment where it's actually gathering lots of metrics from your various users and their devices and look uh, shows you trends as well. So if you have certain users that are getting hit by malware more often than, than others, it's going to show that as well. But all in all, this is a pretty easy one to check out. Uh, you can check it out yourself in your own environment. If you got your own environment, play around with it a little bit and see what kind of data you dig up. Now, one of the things that Microsoft does to really help us is they have what is called threat analytics. Threat analytics ties to Microsoft's threat intelligence team, and they're constantly looking for the latest and greatest threats that are out there, and then they publish that into threat analytics. So it's a great way for us to be able to just look and see what the latest and greatest threats are. We can also see if any of those threats have been discovered in our own environment. So let's take a look at it right now. Here we are on portal.microsoft.com. We're going to click the show all ellipse symbol and then click security. That's going to bring us into Microsoft Defender. And then right there, uh, you got a little drop down called threat intelligence. We're going to drop that down and you're going to see a blade called threat analytics. Now threat analytics is going to show us all of the latest and greatest uh, items that are going on, ransomware, extortion, phishing, hands-on keyboard, activity group, vulnerability, attack campaign, uh, tool of technique. It's going to show us all these latest and greatest uh, items and also let us know if there's any items that have um, hit our environment. Also, if we have resolved any of these um, types of attempts and attacks in our environment. But you can see right here um, these various threats that are out there. And a lot of these are labeled with a CVE, Common Vulnerability Exposure. If you're not familiar with that, uh, there is a company called MITRE Corporation that for years and years now has kept up with, the data, with a database of the latest and greatest threats out there. I can go to cve.mitre.org, hit enter, and you can actually do a search and see what the latest threats are. In fact, I'll just do a search on Windows and I can see these latest threats. Uh, regarding Windows. So it'll display all of these. Well, anyway, the threat intelligence team that Microsoft keeps up with, they actually keep track of all the latest and greatest threats. And um, what it will do is with uh, threat analytics, let's go back over to our threat analytics here. And we'll talk about, there we go. Uh, we'll talk about that. So what they've basic what they've essentially done is they have um, they're showing the latest and greatest some of these that uh, have come out, and from there we can see if any of these have affected our environment in any way, shape, or form. We'd be able to see that here. Okay, if you click on these, they give you a good write up of it. You can look at the analyst report on it. This is what the Microsoft analyst report. They even provide, as you can see, little flowcharts that kind of explain how these take effect. 
if there's any related incidents so you can see I don't have any if there's impacted assets which I don't um, endpoint exposure I don't have any of those and then recommended actions as well um, so they do have some recommended actions to help strengthen uh, our defense there but anyway ultimately what you can do though as a professional that's dealing with securities you can come in here and analyze the latest and greatest threats that have uh, come out and look to see if any of these have um, hit your environment but they also do provide these little charts here that can assist you with that as well latest threats uh, high impact threats highest exposure threats and um, you know you can get a good feel for the stuff that you need to be sort of focused on if there's anything out there most everything here is low you know low uh, exposure level so we're not really you know seeing a whole lot that's high that uh, could be hit our environment but definitely something that's helpful uh, for any type of security professional if you're part of a SOC a, um, security operations center this is going to be a place you're going to spend a lot of time I now want to show you how we can use Microsoft uh, Defender to set up custom alert detections and all of that so here we are on portal.microsoft.com we're going to click show all and then we're going to go down here to security that's going to bring us into Microsoft Defender and then we're going to scroll down under uh, email and collaboration and look for policies and rules we're going to click on that and then right there you'll see alert policy we'll click on alert policy and then uh, from there we can click to create a new alert policy this is going to let us create a custom alert policy all right and then you'll notice that we have various uh, categories here that maybe we want to look at I'm going to do a uh, threat so I'm going to say custom threat management alert could give it a description if I want and I could set a severity level I'm gonna set it to high and then we're gonna click next so if this is detected it will be considered a high alert okay then I'm gonna select the activity kind of activity of a full list of activities that could trigger this alert so a lot of stuff I'm gonna say detected malware in an email message and we're gonna say it is inbound okay you could add additional um, conditions like the sender domain is and I could say something like uh, you know maybe it's a Gmail or something you know and go from there but um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna have all email that's checked if it's got malware it's gonna generate an alert so then you say how do you want this alert to be triggered I say every time the activity matches a rule or you can set a certain volume so it's more than or equal to in this case 15 activities during the last 60 minutes that I'll say every time and then I could say uh, when the volume of the matched activity becomes unusual that's another option I could go so we just kind of look and see if it's abnormal but I'm gonna say every time then we would click next and then I can say right, decide if you want to notify people when this alert is triggered so I'm gonna say yeah JC at examlabpractice.com and I can even set in a limit that way if it gets triggered like hundreds of times it wouldn't send thousands of emails so I'll set this to maybe 50 and then we'll click next all right and then it says do you want to go ahead and just turn this policy on and say yes go ahead and turn this on right away and then we're gonna go ahead and uh, click to submit it and then we're gonna click done and our new alert policy uh, is now created Now you're also gonna notice that you've actually already got a bunch of uh, policies that are already available um, that are just built in to Microsoft 365 Defender so there's lots and lots of these I actually created of course a custom one but um, you know ultimately there's lots and lots and lots of uh, these that are available that um, you you automatically have in place okay like reply all storm detected and you can get a description of that you can uh, see some of the conditions involved recipients all of that okay so these alerts can automatically be triggered and when they triggered you can go over here to alerts in Microsoft 365 Defender and you can see any of these alerts if they have uh, they've already been triggered so that's how we can very quickly easily set up our own custom alerts in Microsoft Defender I'd like to spend a moment now talking about and helping understand what Microsoft Defender for Cloud is now this is not Microsoft Defender for Cloud apps 
this is not Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, but it is part of the uh, Defender scope of products, but it's called Microsoft Defender for Cloud, okay? So to get to Microsoft Defender for Cloud, the first thing to be aware of, this is gonna be done on the Azure side of Microsoft's cloud services. I'm gonna to go to portal.azure.com and if I click the menu button and go to all services, I can just do a quick search for the word Defender. If we put that in, you're gonna see Microsoft Defender for Cloud right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. That's gonna bring me into Microsoft Defender for Cloud. So what exactly is it? Well, if you go out to Google or Bing and just do a quick search on what is uh, Microsoft Defender for Cloud, you'll find this little article here and you can go in and view that article and Microsoft is going to help you understand it. I wanna kinda of go through some of this with you before we uh, go back and look at it in the portal, but they, they, they get across to you that you know this is Microsoft's Cloud Native Application Protection Platform or CNAP as it's called, okay? And the goal is to provide a series of security measures and uh, practices that's going to help us in strengthening our cloud-based applications and uh, protect from various types of vulnerabilities or weaknesses, cyber threats in our environment. The, uh, the other thing to note of note here is that this provides DevSecOps as well, which is Development Security Operations. So this is going to provide a code level, multi-cloud, multi-pipeline environment for looking for vulnerabilities in our different types of codes that would be interacting in the cloud environment. It's also a cloud security posture management, that's CSPM, um, that's going to give us the ability to uh, perform actions against any type of vulnerabilities that have been discovered. And then lastly, it is a CWPP, which is cloud workload protection platform, which is all about trying to provide protection to our servers, containers, storages, databases, and all the other various workloads that we have. And I know this is a bit like alphabet soup. They're throwing a lot of acronyms out here, but um, that's because it isn't necessarily Microsoft that came up with all these acronyms. It's the security industry, the cybersecurity industry as a whole. And then Microsoft is trying to provide a platform that provides all of these in one. And that's essentially what Defender for Cloud does for us. Okay, so you see in their little graphic here, you're trying to unify your development operations, strengthen and manage your security posture, and then protect all of your various cloud workloads that are going to be interacting uh, in your Azure environment. And that doesn't just involve Azure, but as you can see, you've got AWS, you've got Google Cloud, all of that stuff. Okay, so. We're providing um, DevSecOps with secure cloud applications using the code pipeline insights, and then all the various uh, items when it comes to security posture as well. Remember that security posture is something that's gotta be maintained. It's something that's gotta be stayed on top of. You can't just implement the latest and greatest security techniques and expect to remain secure. You have to constantly be updating and staying on top of this. That's the idea of security posture is that it is maintained. Um, but you can see various capabilities here, centralized policy management, secure score capabilities, multi-cloud coverage, the uh, CSPM, the Cloud Security Posture Management, Advanced Cloud Security Posture Management, uh, Data Aware, uh, Security Posture, Attack Path, Cloud Security Explorer, Security Governance, Microsoft Intra, uh, Permissions Management, which again, that, get, that gets into formally Azure uh, Active Directory, and uh, the various workloads have uh, different methods of protecting our uh, environment using those capabilities that you saw there, okay? And again, you've wanted to, to learn, to dive deeper into these, you can click here. But I am gonna um, elaborate, just be aware, well, obviously I'm not gonna click through each one of these um, articles right now and show them to you, but if you wanna dive a little deeper into some of these articles, you can. So jumping back over here into Defender for Cloud, kind of getting a, a quick glimpse of it. You can see the general uh, blades that are available here, getting started recommendations. You can look at inventory, um, security alerts if there has been any. Um, inventory is just gonna show you if I've got any machines or any of that. And you may not see the exact same things I see over here, but uh, security posture under cloud security gives us a, a base idea of that under my subscription. Regulatory compliance, 
which of course is going to get into the concept of making sure that our business or organization is compliant where it needs to be. Um, again, and I'm not diving deep into these right now. I'm just giving you a, an, an understanding of these. But you got workload protection shows the various uh, workloads. If I've got any servers that I want to protect, again, you may not see the same thing I'm seeing here if you are doing this with me. Um, data security, what kinds of data you've got. This gets into linking uh, things like your storage accounts in Azure and all of that. You've got a firewall manager. This helps you in Azure if you're using Azure Firewall and you're managing a bunch of firewalls. You can manage all of that there. Okay, so uh, Microsoft provides a way to do that. And then of course here is the DevSecOps security area, um, so security operations and all of that, where you would manage uh, all of that information here. They even supply um, supply a few videos on things like GitHub and Azure DevOps, and you can connect to your DevOps uh, environment right here. Okay. So that, again, that just kind of gives you a, a, a quick overview of the idea of what Microsoft Defender for Cloud is before diving in, you know, and getting a better understanding of it. I now want to take a look at regulatory compliance in Microsoft Defender for Cloud along with uh, what Microsoft uh, calls their Microsoft Cloud Security Benchmark, also known as MCSB. So here we are on portal.azure.com. We're going to click the menu button and go down to all services. We'll just search for the keyword Defender, and then you'll find Microsoft Defender for Cloud. We're going to go ahead and click on that. And then if we go down here under Cloud Security, we'll see Regulatory Compliance. All right. And uh, as you can see right out of the gates here, it says Microsoft Cloud Security Benchmark, uh, 46 out of 63 controls passed. And so what are they getting into there? If we scroll down, uh, you'll see... Microsoft Cloud Security Benchmark, and this is essentially something they have set up in regarding um, understanding all the various regulations that are out there and then whether or not our environment is matching the benchmarks that Microsoft has set. In other words, they've got a, a baseline essentially of, you know, these are the recommendations for meeting certain regulatory compliances. And then what you need to do is you need to put in controls in place to make sure you are compliant. It's really going to matter in scenarios where that particular regulatory compliance affects your organization. Not every uh, regulation is going to be uh, affecting our organization, but it is a good idea just to, for security in general to try to uh, meet as much of that as you possibly can. So if I look down here, you can see these various uh, regulatory compliances and I can expand those out and you can see which ones that we meet which ones that we don't meet again expanding those out you can look at those you can look at the control details on each of those um, as you can see asset management I meet all of those um, I meet pr some in pretty much all these but you got to remember that in a, a trial tenant where you're just setting up and playing around you're not gonna you're not gonna meet all of these right out of the gates and what you want to do though is work towards strengthening your environment by putting these controls in place okay so if we look to if we expand these out we can we can look at the control details of these and it'll provide some additional information as to uh, what needs to be in place in order to strengthen it and then also like what actions we've got in place some of these of course are automated with azure some of these you will have to put in place yourself okay uh, ultimately um, and uh, but the great thing about this is uh, you actually can they're going to provide you with some recommendations on what you need to do okay here's a control that I actually don't meet it's talking about uh, monitoring and you can see there's some automated capabilities in place and then Microsoft has what they call the Microsoft actions and they tell you this is a work in progress and Microsoft actions will be available soon they're basically telling you that you know they're going to uh, plug some stuff in that Microsoft will be able to hand, do to handle that. Of course, um, by the time you're watching this video, they might have uh, updated that. Um, but ultimately, we can put in uh, compliance policies and strengthen our defenses. If we come up here to manage compliance policy, um, and I'm not going to do this in, in this video, but we have add an environment. And this is where we can actually link Amazon Web Services, Google uh, Platform, GitHub, uh, Azure DevOps, all of that, we can link all that in our environment. And the goal here is to provide a single pane of glass, as Microsoft likes to say, that lets you look at everything. 
So not just your Azure environment. Microsoft has partnered up with Amazon and Google and all of that in order to, um, in, your, in a multi-cloud environment, be able to see everything that's going on and then look at the compliance standards for that environment as well. Microsoft flat out says, if you go and look at their documentation, and um, I've even watched videos of the, the guys that are over this at Microsoft, they will flat out tell you that Unfortunately, there is no, because of just all of the, um, the, the details, features, capabilities of the different clouds in Microsoft, there's not any interface that's going to show you absolutely everything. But Defender for Cloud is going to come pretty darn close to making sure that everything is, um, is compliant. Okay, so uh, ultimately, though, this is a great way to sort of see, okay, where are we compliant, where are we not? Um, and then from there, we can figure out what we need to do in order to strengthen our environment and make our environment compliance, which sort of gets into things like the security posture and workload protections and data security and all that, which I'm not diving into in this video. But hopefully that does give you an idea now of uh, what the purpose of regulatory compliance is. This whole concept of Microsoft Cloud Security Benchmark, which is what they're trying to provide you here. How, how, what is your benchmark, and you know where are you compliant, and where are you not compliant, and then uh, from there we can dive into what we need to do to strengthen our environment. Let's take a look now at uh, Microsoft's Defender for Cloud, the Security Posture Secure Score, and see how we could improve the security score in our environment. Here we are on Portal Dot azure.com if we click the menu button go to all services i'm just going to search for the word defender and then i'm going to go into microsoft defender for cloud all right once we get there we're going to scroll down we're going to go right here where it talks about security posture all right and this is going to tell us what our uh, overall secure score is in our azure environment and of course as you can imagine that when you are um, just starting out with a trial tenant or all that you're not going to have a very high score and keep in mind that um, if you're, you know, if you're doing this stuff with me, you will not have the exact same statistics and everything that I have. You got to remember that um, I use my tenant here for a lot of different courses and, and all of that. So don't be surprised if yours is going to look a little different than mine. Also, Microsoft likes to change the way this looks all the time. So it could also look a little different for you as well. But remember, uh, as you've probably heard me say before, this is just life in the cloud. Microsoft is constantly changing things almost weekly. So it's just what we got to get used to. Things are not going to look the same. If you go to their articles and look at their articles, the screenshots they've got in their articles don't match how things look right now even because they change things so often. Okay, so anyway, here's our secure score. You can see mine right here. Um, it's broken up into these four things here, uh, management groups, subscriptions, unhealthy resources and recommendations. And um, down here under my subscription, my Azure subscription, I can click view recommendations and this is where I can strengthen my environment. So it's telling me things that I can do to strengthen my environment. So I've got enable MFA. If I go down here, uh, expand that out, they're telling me accounts. Let's just click on it. Accounts with owner permissions on Azure resources should be MFA enabled. So it's telling me that I have some accounts that do not have MFA enabled. So it's going to give me, what's great about this is I can expand out remediation steps and it's going to try to walk me through step by step out of how I can do that. Um, sign into Azure AD. Remember that Azure AD has been renamed to Intra ID. They have not updated all their documentation uh, quite yet. Maybe by the time you're watching this video, they have updated this documentation, but um, you know that, that's not always the case. So then you got, you're, it's telling you the account here, John Christopher. Um, that I need to, that I could force MFA on this John Christopher account. Actually, I do have MFA enabled for my John Christopher account. I just don't have this, um, I'm not enforcing this using a conditional access policy. And so that's what it really wants me to do. It wants me to use what's called a conditional access policy in order to uh, enforce this on my user. Okay. Uh, and so that is what they're recommending that I do right there. Um, if I really, if I wanted to go about doing that, I can. I could click the menu button here. I can go to Microsoft Intra ID, which of course, remember, is formerly Azure AD. I can go down here to Security. I can go to Conditional Access. 
I can click to create a new policy. I'll just call this force MFA. Uh, and then I would assign my user. In, in the real world, you're probably going to do this to a group of users, but uh, in my case, I just wanted to do it to that one user because that's my, you know, trouble user or whatever. I'll just search for John Christopher. Select. Okay. Uh, do I want to target any specific resources, any specific apps? No. I'm going to do conditions. And then you'll notice you've got what's called user risk, sign-in risk, device platforms, location, client apps. Um, you've got uh, filters here. These are just various conditions that you can have it check for if you want. I'm not die again. This is not a video that's specifically going over conditional access policies either. This is just giving you the gist of what I would do to solve that problem. So do I want to grant access? Uh, I can say grant, but we're going to require MFA, okay, for this user. So we hit select. I could forcibly turn this on, create and go to create the policy. Okay, so policy should show up if I go over here to policies and there it is right there. Now if I go back over to portal.azure.com uh, menu button all services and we search for Defender, okay I want to clarify this is not going to get updated super duper quickly unfortunately, um, but if we go down here to security posture you're going to see that my secure score is still going to show the same thing. And that is because this is not going to happen very, very quickly. It can take an hour. I've even seen it could take up to 24 hours. So, um, you know, even when I do implement this, you do have to understand that, uh, you know, things, things can take a while before they actually uh, take effect, okay, um, in your environment. So just be aware of that. You also can click exempt if you want. Um, you know, and say, oh, well, we're exempt in this. And, and why you, you might say, well, why would I be exempt? You would be exempt because perhaps you have a third party MFA solution that um, is in place instead of this. It's just Microsoft's Defender for Cloud isn't able to detect that you have that third party in place. So um, that would be a reason why you would uh, do that. Okay. So just be aware of that. And also you'll see here some of the, uh, speaking of like it taking a long time to tell you, in this case, some, some of these policies will give you what's called a freshness inter interval, which tells you that it's, tw it's 12 hours. Um, so just be aware of that. All right. But anyway, that at least gives you a little bit of an idea of, um, you know, how you can improve your security posture. You, you go here, security posture and security score. You go to view recommendations. You click on any of these that you want to improve and it is going to provide you with some recommendations on how to do it, how to strengthen your environment, the remediation steps, and then you can implement those remediation steps, but be advised, it does take time before this is actually going to reflect on your secure score. One of the things that Microsoft also offers in our Microsoft Defender for Cloud environment involves our servers. Now, Microsoft offers what's called Defender for servers, which is part of Defender for Cloud, but you do have to uh, onboard it as a plan, and it does cost a little bit of money each month uh, if you want to enable this. The other thing is that uh, it doesn't just work with Microsoft. You'll find that it works with Google, it works with AWS, and the goal here is to essentially be able to monitor your servers, look for the vulnerabilities, and then um, be able to implement solutions to strengthen the defenses on those servers. Now, if we go out to Google or Bing, just do a quick search for the term uh, Defender for Servers. You'll find right down here, select a Defender for Servers plan. And then from there, uh, Microsoft kind of breaks down what their plans entail. And there's two main plans here. You'll see the Defender for Servers plan entry, uh, one, which is entry level. It's going to provide cloud security posture management for your servers, supports AWS, Google Cloud, all of that. It integrates with Microsoft Azure servers, no problem. Works with Azure Arc. Um, now you also can have a Microsoft Defender for, in, for uh, servers plan two. And with Microsoft uh, Defender for Servers Plan 2, you're going to get some more advanced features. Essentially, it's going to include 
the uh, Microsoft's extended detection and response capabilities that you have in Microsoft Defender on the Microsoft 365 side. The great news is, if all that sounds a little confusing, they do have this little table that sort of breaks it all down for you. So you get Defender for Endpoint integration. Okay, it does integrate with that. Uh, Microsoft 365 Defender for Endpoint, the attack service reduction capabilities, next gen protection, threat analytics. So all of that that we have on the Microsoft 365 Defender side, um, on, which is security.microsoft.com, is also integrated here as well. Okay. We have licensing capabilities. They mention here Defender for Servers covers the licensing for uh, Defender for Endpoint. Licensing is charged uh, per hour instead of per seat. And then um, uh, provisioning for that, they tell you this will happen automatically. Um, provisions for the Defender for Endpoint sensors on every supported machine. All right, unified view, threat detection, the operating system level. So it is monitoring the operating systems themselves. Okay, so then when you get to this point, Threat detection for network level or agentless security alerts, that's only plan two. So you can see the rest of these are just plan two. Microsoft Defender Vulnerability Management, that's a big one. That's looking at all the vulnerabilities on the machine. Security policy and regulatory, com regulatory compliance. Um, you know, look at all of these items here, just in time virtual machine access, adaptive network hardening. Uh, file integrity monitoring, Docker host, so if you're using Docker containers, um, network map, agentless scanning, that's a big one, not having to have an agent. Um, and, uh, you know, for the most part, with the help of uh, this, with Azure, and if you're using Azure Virtual Machines, agent it cannot, can automatically be put in place, but you can also install agents for uh, other servers if you needed to. So if we jump back over here, how do we implement this? If we jump back over here on portal.azure.com. We'll click the menu button, go to all services. We're just going to do a quick search for the word Defender. And we'll see Microsoft Defender for Cloud. We're going to click on that. And then what we got to do is scroll down here to the bottom under Management and look for Environment Settings. All right. And then right here, we'll see where it says Azure. Um, we can see... Uh, in my case with Azure, I have my, it's just showing me my subscription. I don't have AWS. I don't have uh, Google or any of that. Now, if I click on Defender Plan Coverage, let's do that. Keep in mind they do change the screen periodically. In fact, this screen does not match even on their instructions. If you actually uh, do a search on the official Microsoft instructions for onboarding this, these, this does not match. Uh, and that's just because Microsoft constantly changes things. They can't keep their own documentation even up to date. But anyway, if I if I scroll down here, you can see related services. You can see the various uh, services that I that um, can be managed with the, within my Azure subscription. But ultimately, what I want to do is I want to go right down through here where it says subscription, and then look for where it says servers. I've got plan two on and I had actually already turned this on from a different course. But I would go here, click on that, and then from there this is where I would turn that on. So you can see that I have this turned on. It's $15 a month. I can turn this on if I want. And then I can also change the plan if I want. I can look at the settings of this for monitoring, um, which of course is going to get into having this turn on. So this is how you would turn on the agent side of it. You can enable for log analytics if you want, the logging capabilities in Azure, the vulnerability assessment can be turned on if you want. Um, and then right now it's you got I got endpoint protection. It's telling you that uh, this is going to enable the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint include automatic agent deployment to your servers if I want and then I can do the agentless scanning if I want. So I can basically turn these, turn this stuff on if I want, apply that if I want to turn this on, and then uh, continue forward with it. So that is how you would turn that on. At that point, it's going to integrate with my um, Defender for Endpoint and all that. Now, I don't have any servers set up, so I'm not going to I'm not going to get any deeper than that. And plus, it's really just the same concept as monitoring with Defender for Endpoint, which is done on the Microsoft 365 side. But that is how you're going to uh, work with the different plans, and that's how you would turn on this for uh, agent or agentless monitoring.
I'd like to now discuss the concept of uh, Defender for Cloud supporting what's called Defender for DevOps. Now, DevOps is development operations, and this gets into scenarios where you have developers that are writing code involving uh, applications and websites for your Azure environment. Um, it also, of course, can seep over to other uh, clouds as well, AWS and Google. And we need a way to be able to manage that. Now, first off, let's just talk about what it is. If we go out to Google or Bing and just do a quick search for Microsoft Defender for DevOps, you're going to find this little article right here. If we click on that, it kind of breaks down the, uh, the benefits and features that we're going to get out of, uh, of all of this. So uh, ultimately, our goal is to unify the visibility into uh, DevOps security posture. So it's going to provide us with a way to look at the overall posture of our security when it comes to DevOps, making sure that we're um, that developers are writing code that's following certain guidelines and standards um, uh, that essentially play upon watching for the various vulnerabilities that are out there and making sure that we're protected against those. Another thing, of course, is strengthening cloud resources throughout the development lifecycle. So. Um, this is not just a one and done thing again. This is a posture. We are, uh, we have to stay on top of this. The so things have to periodically be rechecked and rechecked and rechecked as time goes on. And then finally, uh, having a way to, when we find vulnerabilities in our code, we've got to triage that. We've got to prioritize and, you know, figure out well what's considered a high vulnerability, a medium or a low vulnerability, and then base um, base our our uh, strategy for strengthening all this on that priority. Here's a just a quick glimpse of looking at this and I'm going to I'm going to jump into the portal in just a second, but I did want to show you this uh, screenshot here Microsoft has. So, as you can see, they've got all these uh, GitHub environments that they've linked in here and they even mentioned there's some unhealthy code there uh, involved. And so they they've got 169 code scan vulnerabilities, uh, 18 exposed secrets, um, you know, some recommendations, all that. And so from there, uh, we would be able to jump right in and be able to figure out what kind of vulnerabilities we're talking about. And our developers can, of course, fix those vulnerabilities. And uh, we can really strengthen our environment by doing that. Okay, so this is going to provide us a way to do that, review our findings, all of that fun stuff. Let's jump back over now to portal.azure.com. Click the menu button, go to all services, and I'll just do a search for the word Defender. And then we're going to go into Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Once we get in there, we scroll down a little bit under Cloud Security. We're going to click on DevOps Security. Once we get into DevOps Security, this is where we would connect to a DevOps environment. So I'm going to click to add a connector, and then from there, um, you know, maybe I am uh, I'm going to use GitHub. So I could I could uh, onboard to GitHub if I want to, but uh, ultimately, you can say add environment GitHub, and it's going to create a resource, a connection resource here. So we just create a resource group. I'll just call this GitHub um, Connection RG. It'll be my little resource group. All right, and I'll click OK. Region uh, is going to be Central US for me, and then I'm going to click Select Plant. Oh, forgot to give it a name. Let's give it a name. GitHub Connection. And then we'll select plan. All right, so DevOps, that's on, that's fine, that's our plan. It's a free preview plan that I've got. Keep in mind it might be a little different for you uh, if, depending upon how quickly they update this. But we'll say authorize. Now we're going to authorize our connection, so we'll click authorize. And uh, so uh, right here, I, I do need to have a GitHub account, but if you don't have a GitHub account, then um, it, it'll let you create one. I do have one and it's already detected that I do have one, but in your case, if this is the first time you're doing it, then you could just create one and then you'll be able to authorize it. So at that point, it's authorized. And then from here, I can install the Defender for DevOps app onto my repositories if I want in regards to, uh, to GitHub. So I can say, yeah, just let's install it on all repositories. All right, and then click Review and Create. And then at that point, we would click to create. Now, it does take a minute to create. And I also want to warn you about something. If you move too fast through this, you 
it may throw an error the first time because if you authorize it, the authorization, even though it says it's done, it may take a minute before it's officially done. So when you first go to create, you may get an error. You have to wait just a minute and then do it again and it should go through. Um, and so then I'm back on this screen. I refresh and I can see the GitHub connector here. You can see that right there. So that is, um, that is connected. And I have to scroll down a little bit to see it here. You can see it and it's telling you that the connection status is in progress. Um, but you can see that my Defender for Cloud is establishing that connection. So that is how we can set up a Defender for DevOps connection with GitHub involving Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Okay, so I'm just refreshing my web browser here and uh, we'll see if it shows up. And again, you do kind of have to give this just a minute. All right, Dev, we're on uh, Defender for Cloud DevOps right here and we're just waiting on it. Okay, so as you can see, it is uh, officially connected. And um, in my case, I don't really have a lot to show here. You, you, you'd have to go in your GitHub account and create things and stuff really to start uh, writing code and analyzing it. And the, the point here is we don't really have to dive into writing code or any of that. The point is just to understand what we're doing here. The point is to link our Defender for Cloud, Defender for DevOps to our GitHub environment or whatever our programming environment is. And now we would be able to um, have this analyze and look for vulnerabilities in our code. I now want to get into the concepts of Microsoft's Defender EASM, which stands for uh, External Attack Surface Management. Now, before we jump in and look at it, Let's talk about what it is. If we do a quick Google or Bing search on Defender for EASM, you should be able to find this little article here, Defender for EASM. We go there, they tell you what this is. They tell you this is a um, service that's gonna continuously discover and manage your digital attack surface to provide an external view of your online infrastructure. The goal here is to look for the various unknowns, try to prioritize risk, eliminate threats, and then of course extend your vulnerability and exposure just to go beyond your firewall. So it's not just, you know, uh, we're normally when we think about threats and external threats, we're always thinking, okay, well, everything's going to stop at the firewall. This is going to try to go beyond that and provide us with a lot of insight information. You can see in this little example here where they've set up a Defender for EASM resources, you can uh, see various domains, hosts, um, you can see SSL certificates, IP addresses, all that. In fact, why don't we talk about that? These are the things it looks at. Okay. So they do tell you here that this is a, a Microsoft proprietary discovery technology. So this is not just an industry standard, like a lot of the stuff that Microsoft puts out. A lot of it is industry standard. So it, it kind of, you know, there's third party solutions and all of that for this. But in this case, this is specifically for Microsoft. Um, and, you know, the goal here is to look at all the various assets based on domain names, host names, web pages, IP address blocks, uh, IP addresses in general, the uh, ASNs, SSL certificates, the who is, all of that stuff. It's going to try to analyze all that stuff and then uh, discover what types of security vulnerabilities we might have to be concerned about involving the attack surface of those provides you with these dashboards, as Microsoft likes to call a pane of glass, that's going to provide uh, all the insight information about the various assets. It also links to the CVE database, the MITRE Corporation CVE Common Vulnerability Exposure. So you have the latest and greatest uh, vulnerabilities involving your various assets. And, um, and uh, we're going to be able to go through and look at those vulnerabilities in regards to this. And again, not just all the stuff that's on the inside, but also kind of focusing on external items as well okay uh, they do tell you that user permissions when it comes to user permissions here for somebody that's going to manage this as an admin uh, the role you have to have is either an owner or a contributor over the azure resource itself um, and microsoft does provide uh, a lot of capabilities for managing this they tell you here that with uh with the easm Capability, Microsoft contains both the global data and customer specific. It's going to be reliable. The data will be stored over up to 30 days uh, and could be stored longer if uh, when potential investigations and all that are being done. All right. 
In the case of a region outage, they tell you only the customers in the affected region would be affected by this downtime. They also tell you that um, Microsoft Compliance Framework requires that all customer data be deleted within 180 days of the organization no longer being a customer. So if you leave Microsoft, their, your information will be gone after 180 days. So those are some of the key elements uh, that, I, that are worth mentioning here. Let's jump back over to portal.azure.com. If we go to the menu button, go to All Services, and we just do a search for the acronym EASM, we should see an option here called Microsoft Defender EASM. We'll click on that, and then from there, we can create a EASM workspace, which is what's going to let us work with all this. So we'll click to create that. Um, specify a resource group. I'll just call this the EASMRG. For resource group, we'll click OK. Give it a name, EASM-demo. And, oh, forgot about the alphanumeric. Can't put a dash there. So then I'm going to do East US, and then I'm going to click Review and Create. Wait for the validation to, uh, to complete. And then once that validation is complete, we'll go ahead and uh, click to Create. Okay, there it is. I'm going to go ahead and pull the trigger and click Create. All right, we'll also just pause this recording while that's getting created. All right, that doesn't take very long. We'll click on Go to Resource. That's going to bring us into the uh, EASM resource, and then at that point, we're ready to go. All right, so we'll go right here um, and click on Inventory, and this is going to show us uh, if we've got any organizations that we can monitor. And they tell you right here, Microsoft maintains an inventory of Internet-facing devices and services assets, which can be used to discover an organization's attack service. Search from a list of pre-built attack surfaces to understand your organization's internet exposure. Don't have an organization, create one custom one. So I'm going to click to create a custom one. And then from there it says, all right, uh, organization names to include for asset discovery, right? They give you an example here, uh, enter the organization name for the attack surface. Uh, these do not have to be the exact legal names. They give an example like LinkedIn, right? So if we do that linked LinkedIn. And then specify domain seeds. They give an example of that. Enter the domains that are under uh, the organization's ownership. So we say uh, LinkedIn.com. We could also exclude. We have IP blocks we could put in here. Host information we could put in here. Email contacts we could put. ASNs. Uh, and then the uh, who is organizations. So we'll click next. All right, and at that point it says custom attack service takes 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours to build as we scan a security graph, and then we would click confirm. All right, so at that point, Microsoft will start putting that information together. You can see here, though, that it's already uh, providing us with information on uh, a breakdown. They're talking about... Uh, queryable objects, all right, the process involves, so I'll tell you the starting, starting with the seed, we can scan our security graph and repeatedly build associations with other assets. So what's neat about this is it is going to interact, it's going to look at our assets in our own environment, right? It's going to look at the email addresses of our users and it's going to be able to scan all of these uh, assets and it's also going to be able to tell which assets are inter interacting with that organization. So in this case, LinkedIn.com, and then eventually we'll get information regarding that output. So we'll be able to go over here to attack surface uh, summary. It's gonna provide us a uh, attack surface summary. Uh, we'll be able to get a breakdown of that, um, look at the security posture of all of it. In other words, is there any vulnerabilities? We got some um, some uh, various regulations like GDPR. We can look at the OWASP top 10 that gets into uh, web development if uh, we have uh, developers writing code that's interacting with it uh, and all that. Um, but definitely something to check out. This is not something that you really need to dive deep into. The main thing is to know what this is. All right, um, here. This is not something though that, that uh, I would worry about diving too deep into. But keep in mind when you do add that organization, it does take a while, okay? And then uh, once you're done kind of playing around, if you are playing around with this in your own environment, you're going to want to delete this resource because we won't need it uh, after we're done playing around with it.
Hey, this is John Christopher. I hope you enjoyed getting to experience a little bit of this course, and I hope you'll join me on the full adventure. If you'll check the description of this video, you'll see a link that'll show you how you can get access to the full course. Now, in the full course, you're going to learn how to set up a practice environment where you can practice hands-on, and I'm going to provide you with lots of virtual simulations that you can do 24-7. All you need is a web browser. So I hope you'll join me, and uh, I hope you'll also give me a like and subscribe. I'm trying very, very hard to get the this channel to build and grow, and uh, so I hope you'll take the time to do that.